Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Impovia, formerly Change Catalyst. I'm also the author of How to Be an Ally and your host for this show. Allyship is empathy in action. We learn what people are uniquely experiencing, we show empathy for their experience, and we take action. Want to learn more? Visit empovia.co, E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co, to check out more of my work. Let's get started. Our guest today is Marisa Andrada, who is culture master and kindness catalyst. She's had an incredible career as a chief people officer with 30, 25 years of experience at Chipotle, Kate Spade, Starbucks, GameStop, Red Bull, and Krispy Kreme. Amazing. So welcome, Marisa. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here, Melinda. Yeah, yeah. So Marisa and I will be talking today about how to change a culture and why do we need to change cultures? I, I was thinking about this and right now, thinking about all of our clients, we have one client who's going through an acquisition. Yeah. We have a couple of clients who are going through rolling layoffs, one who's working to change a toxic, non-inclusive culture. Several people are working to create more values around diversity, equity, and inclusion, of course, in, the, in a, kind of an increasingly yeah. polarized world. And then most of them are grappling with back to work or finding hybrid or remote work culture and figuring out what that looks like. What does that, what does that look like? It's you to redefine that culture. So we're going to talk about all of those things. Um, there's many different reasons for changing your workplace culture, these and many more. And in this episode, we'll discuss where to start, how to create a plan, how to create leadership capability, and what you might think about yes. along the way. I'm excited about the conversation. It should be a lot of fun and super relevant, too, for what you yeah. just described. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So before we dive in, Let's just, uh, for our YouTube audience, describe ourselves for anybody who is blind or low vision. So I'm a white woman with long blonde and red hair. I'm wearing glasses and a black blouse, long sleeve blouse. And in my background and on one side is a, a long skinny, a tall skinny bookshelf with plant cascading down it. Some books of the guests that have joined us over the last three years. And on the other side, uh, uh, my book, How to Be an Ally, is um, surrounded by some plants and, and the, the book has a bright orange cover. Great. Well, I am a woman with long black hair, brown skin, red lips, and I have a bright blue sweater with yellow on it and equally matching blue glasses on. And my background actually is a mirrored cityscape of New York City. Mm -hmm. And there's a white cabinet. I think over my shoulder might be a candle and a couple of books as well. Awesome. Awesome. And our ASL interpreters today are Haley and Talisi from Interpreter Now. You can learn more about them at www.interpreter-now.com. Awesome. Well, let's dive into your story. Can you share a bit about who you are, uh, where you grew up, and how you ended up where you are today? Sure. So um, I am always proud to say that I'm a first-generation American. So I was born and raised in East LA, Southern California. My mom and dad were immigrants from the Philippines. They met here, you know, and then decided to get married. And while they had no family, they decided to create a family. So it's really, I think about my life as trying to pursue this American dream that my parents thought America was full of opportunity in the land of opportunity. And so I share that with you because it was fun growing up in East LA, highly diverse. But then one thing we learned being part of the public school system was that, you know, our education wasn't great. I think about English being a second language for me growing up, although I remember leaving the house, you know, we had different variations of family members who eventually ended up living with us. And there were four languages that were spoken in our house. It was Tagalog and Ilocano. So two different dialects that are Filipino, Spanish, because we had relatives who spoke Spanish, and then English. And my parents would say, only speak English when you leave the house, because we want people to actually pay attention to you and think we want them to take you seriously. 
which I think is maybe something your immigrant parents might say to you. But I share that story because growing up when we were in public school, we would always get pulled aside to get tested into our grades. And it would be things like um, in reading lab, they would hold up a picture and they would say, tell us what this is. And I would say, it's a tree. It's a bird. They'd ask us what color it is. And just based on that English as a second language test, they would kind of put us into a class. And so my parents, who were both working, decided to move to the suburbs. So east, I'll call it Upland. That's where I grew up. And I think what was interesting about that was that we were probably one of two brown families, I'll just say that, in our neighborhood. And what that caused was, you know, before I got into high school, in junior high, I was just very different. You know, I think about um, being reminded about how different I was because kids would make fun of what I was wearing. So we weren't always wearing the most trendy thing. It's just we wore whatever we could afford. Or I always was a big shopper inside my parents' closet and would create outfits out of stuff that I would find at home. Also was made fun of because my skin was dark. You know, I was telling the story the other day to someone. I had a nickname. Uh, because my lips were really big, they called me Bubbles. And then my best friend, who was blonde and blue-eyed, they would call her Boat Driver because they thought I was fresh off the boat. So I think it's really important to share that because I feel like my entire life, I although I was raised to be a doctor, my parents really wanted me to become you know, a physician, that I have been observing human behavior for as long as I can recall being a human. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's all those differences growing up in a multicultural family, first gen American, also trying to be raised traditionally, being the only female. And so there's a lot of kind of double standards in how I grew up. And I was always very curious and very observant. And I think it's important to say that because while I did pursue a degree and changed it midway in biology, um, somehow I ended up in business. And then somehow business led me to human resources accidentally. Um, I was um, a resident advisor in my last year, third year in college. And one of the RAs said, you should get an internship. So I ended up getting an internship, which then turned into a full-time job offer. And I really thought, I'm not going to do human resources. I don't think I want to be this administrative person for my career. Went back and got my MBA My parents said, that's great. Maybe do something in finance because you love men. And um, I ended up getting a job, which back then was heralded as, okay, if you want to be a professional and someday chief HR officer, you're either going to work at General Electric, GE, or at one of the PepsiCo companies. And so I ended up interviewing with all the PepsiCo companies, beverage, restaurants, Frito-Lay, ended up getting a job at Pizza Hut, which back then was majority owned by PepsiCo. It's gone through a lot of change since then. And how I fell into this career of human resources was that was a place where I learned a lot. It was about, you know, opening restaurants. And in order to open restaurants, you need to have leaders who are ready. And what are you doing to make sure the leaders are ready? How are you developing them? And so there's always a map of who's ready now, what are we doing to get them ready so that when we open up a new area or new unit, we can promote people up. And then, you know, that was the whole game. Like, how do you get talent ready? And I think that was really fascinating to me. I think an early in my career experience too was I was still reminded that I was different. I mean, I'll share this with you in that, you know, part of the planning process for talent, we would identify high potential leaders or high potential people, and then they would get an accelerated level of development. And so probably six months into my job, my my manager comes to me and says, in one of my one-on-ones, says, hey, I've got some awesome news for you. Like you are a high potential minority. That kind of went, okay, how is that different from what we've been running with our teams, which is high potential? And ultimately, I ended up um, going to a class which was titled Advocacy for Minority Professionals. And I won't get into the detail of that, but I think what I learned from that class was how to assimilate. So here is our corporate culture. 
here are the rules of success. Here is the success profile, et cetera. And it was a lot of coaching on how to act, what to say. I am being very specific, but like, here's the culture and here's, you know, what makes you successful. And what I realized from that was, wow, I am now working in a fortune 50 organizations, huge organization. Right. And I thought, if this is what it means to be inside a large corporate culture, I don't know that I'm going to last for a very long time. You know, I was always raised with get a career. You know, my parents were boomers, right? And like be in that career forever at, at the same company. And I thought, I'm going to give it two years because I have a lot to learn as an early in career human resources professional. And I, you know, I can play the game. I don't even want to say that, but I'll figure out like how to be authentically me and, you know, still play by the rules, I guess. Yeah. And so I, I get really detailed with you about that early experience because I think that's what really shaped my thinking and really inspired me to pursue a career in people and culture and human resources. Because I, I tell human resources professionals these secrets all the time. You know, I learned these three things about being an HR strategic partner, which is one is, you know, PepsiCo taught me how to understand and define a strategy. So long-term strategic plan, how you distill that into a one-year operating plan, and then how, from a people standpoint, you partner with finance, marketing, sales, real estate, all those different functions to bring that plan to life. And so I thought that was really important learning. I think the second thing too is in order to accomplish those goals, whether they were long-term or short-term, organizations needed to have the following in place. First of all, did you have the right leaders in place, right? Did they have the right capability? And then the second thing is, was there a culture that inspired and motivated people to go and do what you're asking them to do? So I boil it down to, okay, those three things that really have been kind of a navigation or a framework for helping companies grow by making sure you had those things solidly in place. What it also inspired me to do was, you know, I am never going to work for a large company again, is kind of what I told people. I went off to go work in entertainment, where which is where I learned how to forge relationships, where I learned how to speak plain English and meet people where they're at. But I think about like that was an early defining point in my career. And I'll just fast forward, you know, the last decade or so of my career, 12, 15 years, I've had the fortunate opportunity to lead in human resources. And so oftentimes going to brands like Red Bull and GameStop, Starbucks was a little different, Kate Spade and the Chipotle, I was the first kind of professional human resources leader they would hire and you know, into the organization as well as one of the first females on the leadership team, mm -hmm. maybe one of the first persons of color on the leadership team. And uh, I have joined all of these consumer-facing, founder-led or founder-transitioned organizations at a time of an inflection, which was mm -hmm. they've built up so much. And now do you plateau? Do you maintain or do you grow? And I think the unlock to growth has always been people. And so one thing I always talk about is you can't grow companies unless you grow people. I mean, that has to happen. And so that really is my kind of my career. And I really pride myself in how do you cultivate environments that are inclusive, that are diverse? Because when you do that, it creates a culture of innovation and performance and accountability. And so those two have to go together to create success for an organization. And so I've been really fortunate to work in companies like that, oftentimes, actually in every time, a time of transformation. And so, um, and I've enjoyed it. And then most recently, last summer, I decided, wow, I've been inside these large companies. Um, and yes, I went to go work at large companies, but they felt like I can be a part of them because of the culture that I became a part of and that other people had the chance to shape. But I thought I've been inside these large companies and I feel like there's so much more of an impact that I could be making as a culture master 
you know, people are like, well, how'd you come up with that? Well, if you think about the definition of mastery, it's at least 10,000 hours of, you know, hard work and practice mm-hmm. and experience. And, you know, I'm not going to add up all the years, but for sure it's more than 10,000 hours <laughs> of shaping cultures for organizations. Yeah. And I also use the word kindness catalyst just as a reminder that when all else fails and you, you forget anything, you know, start off with kindness. You know, I think in terms of creating connections with people, having grace for others goes a really long way. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, maybe we'll circle back to just to, to that a bit too, as we as we talk sure. through this. How does kindness and how does kindness help catalyze uh, change too? Let's start. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about how you lead that transformation through culture. You you mentioned that, and in each of these places that you came during a time of transformation and really helped lead that change. Uh, Maybe you could share a couple of examples yeah. of of what you did at these companies to get give, give a sense of um, that transformation of what that looks like, and then we can go into the details of how you did it. Sure. So I, I can talk about Red Bull. I mean, one of the first early examples being an, a human resources leader, right, and reporting to the CEO of the company. I joined at a time when the brand had come to the U.S. It was the very first energy drink. As a category creator, it was also part of a privately owned company. It still is. That's based in Austria. And it was a small part of the company. And I think the problem to solve there was the CEO wanted to hire a new head of human resources, a professional, to help really professionalize and build capability of the leaders. So think about Red Bull. The the origin is this hardcore, hard-charging, surfing, skate. Moto, motocross, motorcycle brand, and all these athletes at some point became salespeople and marketing people in the organization. And um, the brand used to be so exclusive in that it was really sports oriented. And now the brand was coming becoming more diverse. So it was about energizing not only body, but also spirit and mind. And it, it was reaching everybody, students, teachers, you name it. So it became more diverse. And so the, the challenge there was twofold. One is, how do you bring more professional capability so the organization can grow quickly? But then secondly, how do you create a culture that supports this diversity with the customers, right? Because mm-hmm. that was also changing. And so um, the work to be done there was helping go through this change and how do you continue to up-level people, like really celebrate who they are, where they've come so far, and put in um, a framework to help them grow, and then layer in a level of expertise so that you had a capable organization to deliver the results that you wanted. And then I think in terms of culture and starting off with the culture, it was really about identifying, all right, where are the different customers, and we called them scenes or pillars that we are going to expand. But then how did that look internally? And so internally, were we doing the same thing in terms of, did we look as diverse as the customer set that we're going after? And so I think that was interesting joining, and that was kind of a starting point and a calling card for you know my team that I inherited to kind of go out there and help create change you know, all in the name of growth for the company. Um, And then a second one that I'll share really quickly is actually the next job after that was joining GameStop. And GameStop is this video game box retailer. And I know it's changed today because of of digital, but at the time the founders almost got purchased by their biggest competitor, EB Games. And overnight they turned the table and said, we're going to buy you instead since you gave us a price. And mm-hmm. overnight, they doubled in size to a $4 billion company with like 4,000 stores, pretty huge company. Mm-hmm. And then they said, you know, how do we actually bring the best of both together? Because we distinctly have a GameStop culture and a way of doing things. We distinctly have an EB Games culture and a way of doing things. And they were looking for a professional HR person to help them kind of like bring the best of both together, you know? And so that was really the charge. And at the same time, making sure you have the right leader capability in place, you know, to then enact the kind of change and development that needed to happen. So those are like two examples of walking in, you know, like literally hit the ground running, right? 
These are the kinds of culture changes that need to happen. Yeah. And I think you, you, sometimes that happens when you're hired to a new role. Sometimes that happens when suddenly you're confronted with some, something very different in the world that you have to yeah. have to change, right? And, and there are um, lots of different reasons why suddenly we're confronted with change, uh, a need for change and uh, need to deal with it immediately. That's right. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so when you're there, when you know that change needs to happen, where do you start? Oh my gosh. I think I start with um, get real clarity and alignment on the problem or the opportunity, right? I call it the problem statement. And it's getting clarity starting at the top with the CEO and the C suite around you or the leadership team on, you know, what are we solving for? And to them, we had to really distill, okay, what does it mean to bring the best of both together? What does this really look like? You know, and they, and they, the way they defined it was, well, it's this aligned culture. We want the same shared values, all of those things. And I think a way to do that is to not just go away and go work by yourself in a room or go to your team in a room, but there's a magic in getting alignment. And so I was such a nerd back then. I know it's different today, but I was huge on PowerPoint and I would create like these three or four page, you know, PowerPoints. And the start that I would have is I went and really understood and learned the business as it is today. There were two companies that came together. So I spent time in stores on both sides and talked to the employees to understand their experience, what they were excited about, what they were worried about, all of that. But doing that at every level, you know, and actually working with my team to do all that listening to then gather, you know, imagine summing all that up and like, hey, here's the state of what's going on today. Here's how people experience this coming together in this culture. And then based on that, try and identify, all right, here's the opportunity and the problem that we need to solve. And I think what I loved about doing that and leaders weren't used to it, you know, I had this three or four, four page deck that was pretty powerful that had, all right, here's the hypothesis problem to solve based on all the information that we got. They love the fact that they can get in there and either agree or disagree, shape it, add in, you know, all of that. So that by the end of it all, you know, that took like a few months just to get all the input and the data that as a leadership team, when we sat down, it's like, all right, now we're going to, we're going to go and champion this. So getting real alignment on the opportunity or the problem to solve and use real feeling and data inside the company to understand that. You know, I always tell people, know the business that you're in, you know, understand it, not only um, understand the product or service that you're creating or, or delivering, but also know how it gets done and why people go in there and do it. So I think that was kind of the first step. And then from there, um, what we did is we aligned on, all right, let's get some feedback on from the leadership team on what our purpose will be. Like, what is our new mission statement as a company? And I remember back then it became, became really crisp about bringing power to the players, right? So how do we together bring power to the players? It was kind of a saying. And then internally we flipped it and said, well, then how do we also bring power to our people that these companies are coming together? And so, you know, I'm giving a very top line, bringing that to life, power to the players. There's a lot of close working with marketing, but then power to the people really working with every department and especially in the stores. What does that look and feel like when we say those things, you know, and then we were able to like really get it crisp into two or three. Here's what it means to bring power to the players you know, one was to create stability for our associates inside the stores, right? The more stable they were, the more consistent they would be in terms of being available to support their their customers coming into the stores. You know, that's one example. And so going back and saying, all right, here's the aligned mission, and then bringing that mission to life to, through, I'll say, aligned three or four key behaviors, which then became the backdrop to really everything that we did. And what I mean by that is from a people standpoint, how was that integrated into how you hire people into the company? You know, how do you promote people based on these values? And even in decision-making for the company as we made investments in people or just investments in the business in general, 
you know, when you roll that through the lens of purpose and these value statements, are we aligned? And so that was a way, I don't want to say it was quick, but a very high level way of, you know, bringing this company together and bringing the best of both together because it was about, you know, I use the word both sides, but, you know, also it was a global company. You had to reach out to Canada, to Australia and to Europe and just also get that sentiment. So going back to that three or four page deck that I walked around with, with everybody or that my team walked around with everybody, you know, the first couple of pages were golden in that they represented the collective of what the organization was feeling and thinking at different levels. And you've got to be able to do that, especially working with leaders in a very simple way. You know, actually less is more. You can have all the backup you want, but like bring the key messages forward, you know, and really represent the feeling of of the people in the organization. And yeah. so that's kind of how we got started on all of that. Now from there, there were other specific things that we did around aligning leadership capabilities and how we select very senior leaders in the organization, you know, and how we redesign incentive programs. I mean, it really did become the basis. So I mean, starting with that, for anyone who is tuning into your podcast, who I've had the chance to work with in other organizations, they'll, they'll probably say, wow, that sounds really familiar. You know, it sounds mm-hmm. like yeah. that's something Marisa and her team would do and yeah. have done coming into the organization. Yeah, I, I want to um, um, highlight a, a couple of things there. One is power. That I, I think that is a really key piece of that because when you're going through a merger or acquisition, when you're going through rolling layoffs as well, there is a vulnerability and a feeling of a lack of power, a lack, yes. of, um, a lack of empowerment, a lack, lack of being able to impact what's happening in that moment. And, and so I think that that, that power is, is a really important piece of that, that, that you're really, you're listening. I mean, and part of that is you're, you're listening and really understanding where people are and using that to, to drive um, where you're going next to, and, and looking for those ways that, that people can be a part of that and empowered to be a part of that. I totally agree with you. I think it is about empowering people right? I think in change and especially change now that's happening. And you know this, I think it's tough when people feel like things are happening to them, yeah, you know, not for them and that they're not a part of it in any way. I mean, sometimes change happens, leaders make decisions, but what I mean by making it empowering people is bring them in, bring them, if even if they don't have the chance to weigh in on whatever the final decision is, be really transparent around the why we are doing this. As leaders, we have made this decision to X and here's why we are doing X and here's what that might mean for you. I think people will feel more empowered, although it may not feel great, especially in situations where things feel like it's happening to them, but it's like there's power in giving people information and treating them as human beings and as adults, right? That like, yeah. I'm going to let you in and share information with you. And I think, and in this case, in that merger, right, of the, in the merger that was happening, it was empowering for them because it was about, we want to hear from you. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's kind of like what um, my goal is to go talk to these leaders, but I need to hear from you and what words I should be saying, what we should be representing. And I think when you, I love using this word co-creation uh-huh. When people feel like they're part of that, you know, there's power in the sustainability of that, right? So it's not just this yeah. wild idea that, hey, it feels really trendy, let's do this. No, I mean, this is really a reflection of, you know, where the organization is sitting today. And, you know, and then I also talk, think about the hopes and dreams that they do have on where it can go, you know? And so mm-hmm. there's power in doing that when you let people in. Yeah, absolutely. and. Can you talk a little bit about the behaviors, how you, you said you had three behaviors that yeah. that you wanted people. How, can you talk a little bit about that? How did you decide what those behaviors were and how did you start to implement that? So it's kind of playbook for me. So rolling up all that information, gathering that, and then going back with the leadership team and saying, all right, now based on all of the pre-work you've done. So it's not only did we do all of this socializing ahead of time, 
you know, I think it's really important too for organizations to look at everything that already exists, all the artifacts, right? So there were two companies that had everything that they were utilizing to communicate with employees, review all of that. And then based on that, we just really brainstormed a couple of things. One is, if this is what uh, our organization is saying up and down the organization, then how do we as leaders work together? What do we expect from each other, right? So mm. it could be as simple as setting ground rules for how we work together, but then teasing out like what we expect from each other and and then talking about the behaviors. And so we came up with like, I, I want to say it was sort of like five or six statements. And then um, again, going back to the organization and saying, all right, as a leadership team, we've come up with these five straw man statements. What do these mean to you? And does this resonate for you, you know, in your day-to-day life working at this company? And then, you know, that took shape. And then, you know, the way that I love doing this is you go to the front line, whoever your front line is, start there and make sure that there's a good representation of that and then move up to that next level. You're not going to get everybody, but what I say is like a sampling, a representation of, let them touch it, you know, Mm -hmm. massage that as well, and then get to, you know, the next levels. And then by the time you're back, you know, it comes back. It's not the game of telephone where it comes back super different, but what comes back is this real authentic language and feeling of like, hey, here's how we would do this every day and how we work together. And so- you know, and use your marketing people as your best friends because they're mm-hmm. great at wordsmithing, you know, mm-hmm. and how you make this language, these three statements that people can think about, you know, off the top of their heads. And so that's how you do that. Like you go and create those statements. And then from there to get really nerdy about it, like those statements could then turn into very specific behaviors that you could be interviewing for. So these three statements then turn into behaviors that when we hire people, this is what we're looking for, you know, that fit this this work statement. So, I mean, that's that's the process of how you go and do that. Awesome. Awesome. And then you also touched on leadership capability um, yeah. as being a key piece of that, that transformation, creating yeah. ultimately the movement that that brings about the change. Yeah. yeah. I think what's interesting is that for the companies that I shared with you, where I've had the chance to lead people and human resources is that, you know, these organizations grew up pretty quickly, right? With the founders and then people who were there at the very beginning. And then all of a sudden now, I mean, imagine again, GameStop, a $4 billion company overnight. And now you're looking at leadership capability. And I think what our founders really wanted was a couple of things. One was, hey, at some point we want to retire. And so when we retire, who is going to succeed us? And what they realized was in order to then double their size, is anyone ready today? And they realized not. So it's like, they're like, go out and um, find the right leader who then can grow up in this organization for the next couple of years so that they really understand it. But then in assessing leadership capability, it is about, all right, if we aspire to grow, I'm just going to say double in size, do our leaders today have the runway to do that? And I think the good news is we had leaders who grew up with the organization and were excellent at what they did. However, they didn't have that now we're a large public company. There are certain professional skills that you can't just grow immediately overnight. And so when you talk about leadership capability, Do you bring in new leaders? Do you augment it with other experts who can help support that senior leader in the organization? So that's what I mean. It's almost like, well, if this is our strategy for growth and here's what we're going to accomplish, that means we need a specific capability and customer insights and, you know, marketing architecture. I'm just going to make that up, but not really because like we didn't have that. And so do we have a marketing leader? who actually was a VP of marketing. And then over time, we ended up bringing a a chief marketing officer who actually had all that experience. And so that's what I mean. It's not always about replacing, but, you know, you know, we had a, um, a chief accounting officer who had grown up in the organization and it was just about bringing in some experts on their name pen to make sure that he was ready for a public company. And so that's what I mean about having the right leadership capability 
But then below that, I think what's really important inside organizations is when you set goals for yourselves, like you really have to ask, do we have the skills and the yeah. abilities to really get this done and mm-hmm. take a hard look at the organization? And are you aligned, organized in the right way? And do you have the right people and skills to deliver on that? So when I think about leadership capability, it is not only at the top, but really questioning yourself as an organization, are we ready you know, to be successful at doing this? And do we have the right skills in place to do that? And that's why I always say you cannot grow companies unless you grow people. And there's two ways you can do it, bring people in and develop people. And so yeah. both need to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I love that. And the, the leadership capability is, um, you know, assessing where you are now. It's a yeah. word is kind of assessing where you are now. Um, what do you have and and what are the skills that you have? Where, where can you build the skills or learn the skills and where do you need to augment yeah. and bring in skills from, from the outside? And yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so then uh, the other thing you you talked about is incentive programs. And I assume that is kind of, well, why don't I not assume yeah. and I'll allow you to say, can you tell me a little bit about those incentive programs? Yeah, sure. So I'll stick with GameStop. You know, one part about bringing power to the people was about, I think I already showed this earlier, is like that, you know, we create consistency and stability for our people, an environment where people feel safe, right? And so- one way to do that, like how do you actually measure that inside a company? And early days back then, we were actually measuring employee engagement. You know, that was an early business back then, right? So we partnered with a company to measure engagement as well, calculate turnover at certain levels in the organization. So it's not only, hey, this is a nice thing to do. Here's what actual measures look like in the company. And then how do you correlate that to business results, right? So we were able to find a way, and again, that MBA really came in handy with myself, but also people who were smarter than me on my team to figure out, you know, turnover engagement really do correlate to profitability and to top line sales. And so for incentives, how do we ensure we have great engagement? How do we ensure that we have great retention, which is the opposite of turnover. Mm -hmm. And so from an incentive plan, we started with a certain level and above that, you know, was pretty hardcore. 20% of your bonus, right? So it's going to hit your wallet. 20% of your bonus will be based on progress that you're making on your engagement and, you know, your retention scores. And so when you think about stability at the center of that is, hey, We don't want managers turning over. I remember the president saying, you know, when I first got there, we were at a conference and it was all of the unit managers. There were like 4,000 people in the room. And he said, if you look to your right and you look to your left and we meet every year, half of you are new. Like we can't continue to do that in order for us to continue to grow. Hmm. And so that's why we chose turnover and engagement, you know, retention and and engagement as a measure for incentive. So it's not only, hey, it's a nice thing to do. We literally are going to hold you accountable for that. And from a people standpoint, you know, that was one of the first measures that we used the first couple of years as we were defining all of this, and then eventually took it down to, you know, the, the unit or the store level. Because once we had stability, at that store manager level, then they would create that stability inside the stores. Hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about all of the companies that are working to get more, well, they're working on the what to do and how to, I think a lot of companies first wanted everybody to go back to the office after yes. after things changed. And then I'm now a lot of companies like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> So now we'll do a hybrid. And and then I think there's still a lot of companies, I, I know a lot of companies are still working through, okay, well, that's not working very well either. Are there incentives? Are there things that you have seen um, or would suggest that people might do as they're working to change those cultures? Yeah, I think it's interesting because a lot of what I shared really does apply to the change that's happening right now. And I the yeah. question's super popular, like, 
How do we become a hybrid culture? How do we become a come back to the office culture? And I think at the end of the day, you know, leaders and and people inside the companies just really need to find who do we want to be? Like, what is our culture, right? And align on those values. Like, yeah. what does it mean to work here? And, you know, in, in defining that, I think that's going to really drive, are you successful hybrid? Are you successful all in the office and why? But beyond physically where you're working, I think there's something that rings true, which is maybe why you asked a question around incentives. You know, I think there's real, when people give real clarity, so when managers give real clarity around, here's, you know, the goals and the expectations that I have for you in your Mm -hmm. job, right? Here's, first of all, the job that I hired you into or promoted you into, and that you were realistic in the job and realistic in the skills that you put in the job. And then here's what I expect of you, getting real clarity in that. But not only what I expect of you in terms of deliverables, but also how do you measure that? So it's like, how do we measure these deliverables? And I think, you know, I'm just going to say this, maybe it's just my point of view, I think when leaders do that really well and along the way, check in. So it's not like, hey, I'm going to just let you go and do that. And then at the end of the year, we're going to have a conversation about how you did. And maybe that was more of a way of working when we were all together in the office. I think it's harder now if you don't do that, right? So what I saw happening during the pandemic were, um, you know, everyone was working from home, sheltering at home, and we thought it was two weeks ended up being two months slash two years or three years. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest thing having been in people and, you know, my team being business partners is that there were leaders who actually had to practice and be super intentional about, all right, here's what I expect from you. And then here's what success looks like. Here's how we measure that. And you needed to check in with them more intentionally as well, because it's not like you could throw something over the cubicle wall, you know, like, hey, or pop up and go, hey, what are you working on? What are you doing? It really required a new kind of leadership skill that was very accountability driven. You know, I I think that's one thing I'm saying. So I always put aside, should we be in-person or hybrid? And I think the bigger question is, do we have leaders, people, managers who are capable of actually aligning on expectations Mm. setting good outcomes and measurable outcomes and giving good feedback along the way. Like that should exist no matter how you're working. And so I think I just turned the whole question that I think that's what I see in terms of culture today, you know, in this year of efficiency that a leader has coined, right? Yeah. Just because you change the organization doesn't mean that you've set these new behaviors of accountability. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's less about the incentive. Well, maybe incentives and accountability kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and I think the incentive needs to be for people who are responsible for people. I really believe, and again, organizations are very different. How do you incent them? How do you hold them accountable for people, right? And in this way. And mm-hmm. so, you know, is there a part of their bonus, right? The short-term bonus for the year that does measure, you know, their ability to guide and support their people. I think that should be, look, regardless of how you end up working in person, in the office, hybrid, like that also should be a way to incent people and, yeah. you know, and hire leaders who actually want to do that, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And that goes back to the alignment. Do we have yeah. who we need to go yeah. to the next next stage in our in our culture and our business? Yeah. That's right. Um, and and the, the other thing you said at the beginning, too, I think is really important. I just want to mm-hmm. highlight that before we move to, move on, is that it's not necessarily about remote or hybrid culture. It's about your culture overall and how you're That's defining right. it. And and I think that is a really important piece that a lot of folks aren't thinking about right now. That's right. Yeah, I'm glad we're able to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, behavior change takes time, right? Culture change takes time. How long did it take to transform these organizations that you were working with? Well, I think what was unique about these organizations is that I did come in at an inflection point, right? So I think about 
GameStop, EB Games and GameStop coming together to become the new GameStop was an inflection point. And so when there is a, um, a, a disruptor like that, right, I think change can happen very quickly. At my most recent organization, I used to work at Chipotle. I joined at the time when the board brought in a new CEO and it was post this food safety crisis. And the company had no choice but to change, right? So they did a great job in creating an amazing council of food safety experts and food safety protocols, but that wasn't enough. You know, it was all about, hey, do we have the right culture, the right leadership again to get us out of this? kind of dip that we were experiencing and take us into the future. And so back to your question of did culture change happen pretty quickly? We had to, because these were disruptive events, you Mm -hmm. know, so GameStop, these two companies came together and how do you quickly hit the ground running without missing a beat, you know, on, on the culture. And so I think within the first year, you can really see everything coming together And then even at Chipotle, you know, that was super drastic. You know, I I say super drastic in that I've always said it was like a hard culture reset. And I say that because after 25 years of that company being based in Denver, you know, the leadership team said, hey, we are all over the place in terms of locations. And part of the culture that we want to preserve is like this collaboration and being together. And part of it was, once you had all these offices, you had leaders sitting in different places that if they weren't sitting in the restaurants. And so we decided to shut down Denver and relocate to Newport Beach, as well as build out capability and functions in Ohio, where we already had like a accounting service center. And so I say that was a hard reset because in the first year we had to hire, oh, 85, 90% new headquarter people Right. And very quickly, that exercise that I walked you through, you know, very quickly, we went in and codified our purpose and values and used that as a way to really identify new people and leaders into the organization, you know, and a way of rallying people together when, you know, this new leader, CEO and his leadership team are coming on board. After all that work of co-creation with the organization, really bringing that forward and saying, hey, this is who we are, this is where we're going, and this is how we are. And I think doing that in the first year really created amazing traction. You know, I'll use parallels too between the GameStop and the Chipotle experience. You know, GameStop, we grew that company to a $10 billion company in four years. And I really believe had we not done that hard work in the first year, there's no way that would have happened. I think the same thing with Chipotle we didn't know it then, and now it's all hindsight. But you think about the hard work on really getting clarity on purpose, values, and culture. You know, it was 2018, 2019, we hit our stride, and you know, the company was just performing the best it's ever had. And then the pandemic happens in 2020. And here's the deal. We'd already gone through this crazy change, aside from working from home, for the people that were, you know, in the office and now having to work from home, I think that created um, resiliency, right? And stability of having gone through that and using that as a right, we're going to make these values a lens through how we're going to make decisions, especially during these hard times. And then I think, you know, at GameStop, same thing. And then, you know, Chipotle, aside from culture, which I think was the foundation for transformation, all sorts of other things like digital and marketing and developing people, et cetera, really increase the trajectory of the company's growth. I think, you know, our market cap at the time when I joined the stock price was like three twenty something, eight billion dollars. When I left, the stock was nineteen hundred and it hit two thousand last week. But again, so you also see how culture, I think, plays a big part in transformation. And if you do that and get real clarity around that, it helps you kind of weather through these times that are, you know, um, tumultuous or new to you. Like, I think getting clarity on that really helps you through the hard times, right? And times of uncertainty. Yeah. And I want to circle back just uh, quickly on on being a kindness catalyst. And I think what I'm hearing is part of that kindness is that transparency, that empowerment, that collaboration, co-creation, and everybody working 
in a transparent way toward change together. Yeah. 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 I think when people hear kindness, they go, oh, you're a nice person. It, mm -hmm. Yeah. If you are really nice and you're, you know, you want to pay a compliment to someone because you really mean it. Great. That's kind. But you are spot on, Melinda, in terms of kindness. It is about to be kind is to be clear and to be transparent with people because it is about helping people get on that right path, right? Because you're clear about your intentions. And I think yeah. there's another piece too around kindness, which I always love talking about to you that, um, especially in times of stress, right? In times of change, sometimes, and I know this about me, like that stress can fall onto your family or fall onto the mm -hmm. people around you. If you're, you know, working with your colleagues and they're online or, you know, you're in person. And I think it's, I don't intend to be stressed out around you, but I think when people give each other grace, sometimes that goes a long way. You know, like yeah. it's when you start from a place of good intentions, I guess that's what I'm saying, then you get much further faster when you're engaging in something new. And like, and especially for strangers, you know, this goes back to, I, I shared a little bit about my childhood. Look, you know, I, I, I don't know how some of these kids were raised that I grew up around. I'm like, wow, my parents always said be respectful to people. And so to experience that as a child, you know, can impact who you are and how you show up, you know, at work. Right. And so that's what I mean by kindness. Like, I think there's a capability of doing that. I think anyone could be capable of at least taking a beat. Right. Yeah. And like, all right, I'm going to experience you the way I'm experiencing you. And, you know, you might be having an off day and maybe it has nothing to do with me. And so that's what I mean. Like kindness, sometimes people kind of take on what other people are bringing to them. And it's not even about that. Like let them be and have that empathy, right? Like figure that out. So anyway. Awesome. 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 I love it. I have two quick questions. The first yeah. is about learning and then taking action. So what action would you like people to take coming away from our conversation? Oh my goodness. I think the action that I would personally take and in terms of you creating your own culture is get really clear about who you are. You know, who are you and what are your key values? You know, and when you think about that, are you living that today, you know, in the organizations or the companies that you're a part of? And if you are great, talk about it. And if you're not great, identify it and then work with your manager or someone around you to then close that gap. I think that's really important. I mean, it starts with kind of getting real clarity about who you are and what you stand for and then mapping that against the current situation. I mean, and if it's, it's aligned right on, what did you learn from that? And how do you help others do that? Right. And if it's not, then solve for that. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Well, it's super easy. My name's Marisa Andrada. So M-A-R-I-S-S-A-A-N-D-R-A-D-A.com. I have a website and you'll see all of my blog posts. You'll see a link to my conversations. And so that's probably the best place. And, you know, LinkedIn, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter as well. Same thing, just my first and last name. Awesome. Marisa, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and um, for all of the work that you do. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. It's just so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you everyone for listening and watching and please do take action and we will see you next time. Thank you for being part of our community. You'll find the show notes and a transcript of this episode at ally.cc. There you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter with additional tips. The show is produced by Impovia, a trusted learning and development partner offering training, coaching, and a new e-learning platform with on-demand courses focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can learn more at empovia.co. That's E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co. Allyship is empathy in action, right? So what action will you take today? <laughs>